Okay, now we're good. <laughs> Hey, what's going on Vortex Nation? Welcome to Ask Vortex. Now, what better way to kick off the second episode of Ask Vortex than to start talking about the third episode? Now, we know a lot of you are really excited about the new for 2018 products that we released not too long ago. We wanna let you know that any questions you ask to Ask Vortex for the next one are gonna be a new product specific. So ask us all the questions you want about the new products coming out in 2018, and we're gonna release that one right around SHOT Show. So without further ado, let's get right into it. All right, now, Canuck Gear Reviews wants to know, why are there no fixed power tactical rifle scopes in the Vortex lineup? What is the likelihood of a fixed 10 power PST Gen 2? If you leave the PST Gen 2 2 to 10 and an HS 2.5 to 10 in a room after hours with a good bottle of wine, the result would be tremendous. Well, I'll tell you what, Canuck Gear Reviews, we don't drink wine too much around here, but we are gonna test a little something out with bourbon. So, let's see what happens. Oh, hate to break it to you, Canuck, but we forgot to mention that the Viper series is about two years sober, so might have to wait until next New Year's Eve party for that. But anyway, to answer your question a little bit more seriously, the idea of a tactical fixed power rifle scope is just one that we have not been asked for overly by a lot of our customers. I think these days with modern optical systems and the, uh, the fact that you're not really giving up a whole lot by going to a variable power optic is just attractive to a lot of people just because you get that much more versatility. But who knows, maybe in the future someday we'll see an absolute need for it and people will be banging the doors down to get those. So we'll keep that in mind and we appreciate you giving us the feedback. All right, so next up we got Seth. Seth Sharp wants to know what is parallax on a red dot? And does Vortex have any red dots without parallax? Well, Seth, that's a great question. And I think the best way to start out is by cutting over to our dear friend, Rachel, as she does some math. Parabola. Right, thank you, Rachel, for that enlightening experience. Now to put parabolas into a little bit more context of the red dot, we have one right here. And you see, the, the parabolic lens on a red dot is towards the front end, and its sole job is really to reflect the LED emitter on the opposite side of the optic to give you that red dot point of aim. Now, all red dots on the market are set up in such a way that they're going to extremely minimize the effect of parallax error, be that shooting at varying distances or if your eye becomes off-center from the optic. Now, none of them are truly 100% perfectly parallax free. You see, when I say parallax free, that's really kind of for all intents and purposes or for 99.99% .99 of the uses out there. If you're at extreme close ranges, especially, uh, or also if your eye starts becoming extremely off center from the optic and you just really notice you're getting out to the edges, uh, then you might start to experience some parallax. But really our dots are no different from anybody else's out there and, and really anytime you hear the phrase parallax free, it's again kind of referring to that 99.99% .99 of uses out there, you're not gonna have to worry about parallax. So hopefully that helps you out. Now Danny wants to know, on a second focal plane, you zero at the highest mag, but what happens as you go to lower magnifications? Now Danny in this case is shooting a 12 gauge, but this actually goes for all types of calibers and all types of rifle scopes that are topped off with a second focal plane reticle. I tell you what, we actually have Jameson back at the whiteboard this time, and he's going to help with some pictures. All right, thanks, Jimmy. So here we have a 4 to 12 optic drawn out for you, calibrated at 12x, so the size of the image in relation to the size of the reticle is true. You'll notice that the target goes down to the third hash mark on the 12x. As you zoom out, you'll notice that the center crosshair has not changed a bit, and the reticle has stayed the same size. Now, if you try and use the 4x to hold over or range out, any data that you will use using these hash marks is going to be inaccurate. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Back to you. Excellent drawing skills, Jameson. Thank you very much. So as Jameson showed on the whiteboard, whatever magnification your second focal plane rifle scope is calibrated at, you're going to be able to use your center crosshair, and you're also going to be able to use whatever hash marks is on the reticle because those measurements are going to be true in relation to the image size. Now, as you back down to magnification, those hash marks are no longer going to be sized correctly to the image because the image has shrunk and your reticle has stayed the same size in relation to that image. 
You can always use your center crosshair regardless of what magnification you're on. It's just those hash marks that you're going to want to make sure you're only using on the calibrated magnification. Uh, if you want, some ballistic calculators will get a little bit crazy for you and they'll start telling you what those hash marks correspond to at different magnifications, but that's just another thing to remember out in the field and it might complicate things a bit for you. So hopefully that helps a little bit out with the second focal plane reticle situation. All right. And now we have Lars Lundquist, and he wants to know, in a ballistic app, you need to input the sculpt height. So how do we do that? All right, Lars, now we got a rifle here to show as an example. Now, assuming that it's a bolt gun, kind of like this Ruger American we've got set up with a Viper HST, uh, there's actually a pretty easy way to get that height. Now, what the ballistic app is going to want is your scope's height from the center of the scope to the center of your bore. Now, we can assume that the firing pin on your bolt is going to be extremely close to the center of the bore, and at least definitely close enough for the ballistic app to be very accurate. So if you back out your bolt about halfway, and then you get something in there to measure from that firing pin to the center of your scope tube, use that measurement and plug it into your ballistic app. And again, that's the, that's the type of measurement that we've used on all of our rigs, and it's turned out to be very accurate. So that's how we recommend to do it. Uh, on other firearms too, you can use, generally speaking, the same way because the firing pin should be very, very close to that center bore, if not exactly on it. So, there you have it. Let's keep moving on. All right, now Reed Sanderson, he's got a two-part question. First off, he wants to know, is second focal plane or first focal plane better when shooting at distance? All right, Reed, first off, I'm gonna apologize because my answer is going to be neither. Now, I know that doesn't help things, but luckily there are certain scenarios where one is definitely going to be wanted over the other. Now, the one that pops in my head right off the bat would be, let's say you are get, trying to get into competition long range shooting, like PRS, for example. Now, those guys are shooting at a lot of varying distances. There's a lot of movement involved, and sometimes even the targets are moving as well. Those guys need an involved reticle and they don't have time to worry about what magnification they're on or they don't always have time to really dial a whole lot on their turrets. So they need to be able to use their reticle on all magnifications and without having to consciously think about what magnification they're on. So a first focal plane in that regard is definitely going to help somebody there and a second focal plane would actually end up being a bit of a hindrance. Now, in most long range shooting scenarios, is second focal plane going to be a bad way to go? No, that's not the case. If you're a guy who goes to the range and you really just enjoy dialing your turrets and shooting off the center reticle, second focal plane is definitely a good way to go. And actually, it's a little bit more affordable route too if you're looking at all things similar. Same scope series, a second focal plane will be a little bit more affordable than a first. Uh, also, you can consider the fact that you don't have to worry about your reticle appearing to grow or shrink. So sometimes it'll cover up a little bit less target on your maximum magnification. Plus, most of the time when you're shooting at long range anyway, you are on the maximum magnification and most second focal plane reticles are calibrated to the maximum magnification. And so you can just use your hash marks there anyway and then on other magnifications, just dial and shoot off the center reticle. So again, it depends on your application. Some people just prefer one over the other and we can't argue that of course, but depending on your application, uh, some of those things are ones that you're going to want to take into consideration. So hopefully that helps. And if you have any other questions regarding first focal plane or second focal plane specifically, definitely let us know or any specific application, let us know and we can help point you a little bit better into the, uh, into the right direction. All right, now your second part of the question, Reed, actually brings us into another little section that we like to call the recommendation station. All right, now with that said, you did want to know also, what is a good scope option for a 6.5 Grendel AR? And we've got a couple of those right here. All right, Reed, now to answer your question on a 6.5 Grendel AR, now that's clearly a caliber and a platform that is highly capable of some mid to long range distance shooting and very accurately. So depending on some of the features you feel are absolutely necessary and also depending on your budget, these are three great options right here that we would recommend. Now, uh, first off, you've got the Diamondback Tactical, and we got a 4 to 12 or a 3 to 9 by 40. Now, these guys are, are simple. They're a very excellent optical system, high performing. They have tall, dialable turrets, and they track great. And then they also have a highly usable VMR1 MOA reticle with the hash marks that you can use for holdovers, you can use for ranging targets, and other things like that. So a great option that comes in right around the $300 mark, so that's pretty solid when it comes to price point. Next up, we've got the Viper HST. Now, the one that I'm holding is a 6 to 24 by 50. It is also second focal plane like the Diamondback 
tactical. Uh, that said, now we have a few upgrades, like a little bit better optical system. We have a 30 millimeter tube for a little bit more travel, internal range of adjustment. And uh, we also have a side focus parallax knob, uh, which is a nice thing to have if you're getting out to some mid to long range distance shooting. Varying distances, if you have a side parallax knob like this, you can help eliminate any possible parallax error, which can change your point of impact just slightly if you're not perfectly on the stock, for instance. So that's a great option. Four to 16 and a six to 24 are available in that line. Again, a little bit bigger magnification from the Diamondback Tactical, and you're in about that five to $600 range. Now, next up, we've got the PST Gen 2, which is the best out of our little good, better, best lineup here. Now, like the HST, this has a 30 millimeter tube. It has the side adjustable parallax knob, but now we also have a few other upgrades. We have a better optical system with a little bit bigger field of view and a little bit better clarity. We have uh, some very, very uh, nice zoom ranges like the 3 to 15 I'm holding here or a 5 to 25. Get a little bit more versatility there. And uh, in the turret system here now, we have integrated a mechanical zero stop in the elevation turret. So let's say you're out at the range and you're dialing all day. And then by the time your range day comes to an end, you need to bring yourself back down to zero. Well, the true integrated zero stop is going to help you do that and make sure you're not a full revolution or a couple of clicks off the next time you're out of the range and you're wondering what the heck happened to your zero. Uh, other nice things that the PST Gen 2 has is an integrated illumination dial into the parallax knob there. Nice and streamlined and an illuminated reticle is good if you're in low light or uh, something like that. Also, now you have the availability of a first focal plane reticle in this series as well. The Diamondback Tactical and the HST are both second focal plane only, and now you get the availability of first focal plane in the PST Gen 2 series. Uh, like the HST, MOA or MRAD is also available. For now, the Diamondback Tactical is just MOA, so another nice thing to have in these two options here. But uh, anyway, if you have any other questions on these specifically for your rig, definitely let us know. Uh, on any kind of an AR platform, your options are kind of endless. You could also go with a one to six or heck, even a red dot if you wanted to. So hopefully this little lineup here helps you out though. All right, now next up on the recommendation station is going to be Gary Duggan, interested in getting a rangefinder. Now let's talk about the uh, different options here within our rangefinder lineup. First things first, you're going to want to choose between do you want a monocular style or do you want a binocular style rangefinder? Some of the advantages, of course, to a monocular style are that it's smaller, lighter, more compact. Uh, and then the binocular, you end up combining two different pieces of equipment into one, which is pretty convenient when you don't have to carry around binoculars and a rangefinder. Um, also, you get to use both eyes, which for some people is a little bit more intuitive. Anyway, uh, let's talk about first monoculars. The first thing that you're going to notice and the biggest thing that's going to differentiate all these is the ranging performance. Uh, now, most of them get indicated by the number in their name. For instance, Ranger 1300, Ranger 1800, and, and that refers to their maximum capable range on highly reflective targets. Um, highly reflective targets being, you know, perhaps it could be the side of a, a metal building or it could be just the broad face of a flat rock, for instance, if you're out in the field. Um, things like deer, stuff like that, those aren't considered highly reflective. Usually you're not going to be able to get the absolute maximum ranging capability out of any rangefinder on a, on a deer or something like that. But regardless, those are going to be the biggest differences between all the rangefinders. And as you move up in ranging capability, usually you move up in price and things like that too. Coming in at the beginning of our line, you have the Impact Rangefinder. Now this guy is still pretty new. It's 850 yards capable. It has an intuitive display and it also has angle compensation. So let's say you're in a tree stand, you're ranging a deer below, it will be able to account for that angle to give you the true horizontal distance from you to the deer. Uh, now this is an excellent option that comes in at just about 200 bucks. So it's a great price point. If you don't need to go crazy with your ranging distances or anything like that, definitely check out the Impact. Then you've got the Ranger series. Now, features-wise, both of these are going to be the same. So you're going to notice that uh, in, in an upgrade from the Impact, perhaps you've got the now belt clip, which is very handy to have your rangefinder on a clip. It can go on a molly pack, it can go on your belt, or anything like that. Uh, it also has an illuminated display now. So if you're using it in low light or you're trying to range something that's kind of against thick brush and you want to make out the reticle and the, and the different yardages on the screen, you'll be able to do that a little bit easier with this illuminated display. Um, otherwise, it still has angle compensation and, uh, and, and a lot of the other things that the Impact has too, but now bigger ranging performance. So you can get the Ranger 1300, you know, with 1300 yards ranging performance or an 1800 as well. 
So uh, again, biggest difference is their ranging capabilities. So when it comes to the binocular range finders, you have the Fury HD. Now this guy is 1600 yards capable on the ranging, and uh, it also has an HD optical system with a binocular. So you get 10 times zoom of the binocular, whereas all of these guys are going to be about six times zoom. So you get a little bit more zoom on this. You can see out a little bit further. Um, and then of course you're combining two pieces of optical equipment into one. So for a lot of folks, that's really convenient. We got asked to, to make a binocular rangefinder for many years, and so this is finally it. And uh, and we're seeing a lot of people using these, whether they've got you know their bow in one hand or their rifle, and they're ranging a deer, or they're just glassing a hillside. They can do that now without having to set something down, grab another thing, range really fast. You can be a lot quicker. It's a little bit more convenient for those folks. So. Uh, there you have it. It's kind of the rangefinder rundown. And if you have any other questions on any one of these specific models, definitely hit us up and let us know. We're always happy to help out there as well. All right, now Mike Van L wants to know what is a good scope for both hunting and long range. Well, I'll tell you what, Mike. I'm going to clear these off here, and then we are going to introduce you to the Viper HSLR series. Now, in this series, there's two possible options for you. I happen to be holding the four to sixteen by fifty. There's also a six to twenty-four by fifty. Now, both of these are going to be great options for somebody who wants to go out and go hunting and then also use that same rifle and scope combination to hit the range and start hitting some targets that are pretty far away. So reason being there is one, you have the Viper optical system. So it's a great optical system, great performing. It's going to do really well in low light situations and it's also going to do, uh, it just provide you that clear, crisp image that you need when hunting and shooting long range as well. Now, a few of the really notable features that this has, and one of the real differences you'll see across most of our Viper line is the turret system. Now, in this case, we've mixed that of a hunting and a tactical turret system. So we have this tall kind of tactical style elevation turret that's exposed, and that helps you get to your turret a lot quicker. It also helps you uh, just kind of by nature of a tall turret get a little bit more available adjustment in there in your elevation range, which is ultimately the most important thing when shooting long range because your bullet's going to drop quite a bit, much more so than it's really going to get blown by the wind or move side to side. So that's huge for guys who are looking to shoot long range is having that tall turret there. Now it has a capped windage turret and reason being there is for the most part when guys are hunting, they don't want to have a, an exposed windage turret like that because let's say you're carrying your rifle around in some thick brush or it's getting bumped around quite a bit they don't want to worry about their zero getting bumped off and uh, capping that windage turret is key in doing that and kind of giving you that peace of mind of not having your windage get bumped off while you're out in the field also just usually when you're shooting long range you're dialing mostly elevation and uh, if you need to you can give it a couple clicks of windage while you're at the range or while you're out in the field but the elevation is the most important thing there of course, you also get things like the side parallax adjustment too, and uh, the zoom ranges of 4 to 16 and 6 to 24 are excellent for, uh, for long range. The 6 to 24 is actually even a first focal plane if you prefer that as well. And as one of those Christmas tree style reticles, our MOA XLR reticle. So super good option for somebody. Anytime we hear the, the key phrases hunting and long range together and somebody wants both those things, we always point to the HSLR. So, Hope that helps you out there with your hunting and long range rifle. Now, next, Josh Lundy wants to know, hey, I'm a competitive shooter, I shoot a lot of competition, and I want to get into long range with my 6.5 Creedmoor. What's the best scope to shoot 1,000 yards? Uh, let's move these off the desk here real quick. Boom, here we go. All right, now these just kind of magically appeared here. So we've got three great options for somebody who's looking to get into long range competition style shooting. Now, again, we're going to kind of line it up as a good, better, best option for you. Now, you may want to choose any one of these based on the exact style of competition that you're getting into, but all of them are really great performers at long range. So, again, uh, we saw this before. It's the Viper HST model in a 6 to 24. It's got both exposed elevation and windage turrets. It's got a 30 millimeter tube, great optical system, 6 to 24 zoom range, and a highly usable VMR1. Uh, MOA or MRAD hash mark reticle. So right there, it's going to be an excellent performer at long range. Uh, the one thing is that with this model of optic, you can only get it in second focal plane. So like we mentioned before, let's say you're getting into PRS, that's probably not going to be your ideal scope. That said, it does come in at a pretty nice price point. Uh, I'd say the most entry level of all these three for sure. So if you are looking to stick to a budget, that's the option we'd recommend you checking out. Now moving on, we have our Viper PST Gen 2. 
Now, a little bit of a step up from the HST, a few of the things you're gonna get with this optic are going to be an improved optical system, you're gonna get a little bit better field of view, you're gonna get a little bit better clarity, uh, things like that with our, with our Gen 2 PST optical system. Uh, you're also gonna get some really useful features for guys, like we mentioned earlier, let's say you're shooting PRS, you're gonna get the availability of first focal plane and some more involved reticles, like our EBR2C, for instance, it's that, that classic Christmas tree style reticle. Uh, you can get in an MOA or MRAD. The, the zoom ranges of 3 to 15, like I have here, are the 5 to 25 by 50. Excellent zoom ranges for someone looking to shoot long range. You've got lots of range of adjustment, and really nicely you have that integrated mechanical RZR zero stop, which after a full day of, day of dialing is invaluable just to make sure that you are always going right back to your zero, and the next time you go out to the range, you're not wondering what the heck happened to it. So. Uh, both these options, the PST Gen 2 series, excellent series to get into if you're, if you're wanting to shoot long range, absolutely 1,000 yard capable. All right, Josh, now next up you've got the Razer HD Gen 2. Now if you're looking to get the... All right, Josh, I think we got rid of a little bit of that interference, but let's talk about the Razer HD Gen 2. Now, a feature monster, essentially, here. You've got 34 millimeter tube. You've got locking turrets. You have an integrated LTEC zero stop, which is a bit of an updated version over the RZR zero stop, a little bit simpler to use. Very, very nice integrated mechanical zero stop. Uh, you have also the illumination dial integrated on the side, similar to how, like we had on the PST Gen 2, but this one is locking, so that's pretty unique in and of itself. Uh, and then, of course, features are great to have, but you do need the optics to compete at the highest level in long-range competitive shooting. So the optical system in the Razer HD like we have here is going to be one of the best out there. In fact, in our line, it really is the best that you can get. And uh, just take a look behind one of these whenever you get the chance, and you'll see exactly what we're talking about. So again, if you want the best of the best when it comes to optics for long-range competitive shooting, definitely check out the Razer HD Gen 2. All right, everybody, that about does it. We just have a couple quick hitters here before we leave, and Go6 Cougs wants to know any chances of getting a red dot with a little bit longer battery life. Check out the new Crossfire red dot for 2018. New dot, excellent battery life. All right, the Red Man Clan wants to know what quarter are them 2018 Strike Eagles gonna be released? I'm really, really feeling the 18X. First quarter. And lastly, YouTube moderator, how many lenses are there in the HST 4 to 16 by 44? There are 11. All right, everybody, that does it. And remember to tune in next time, late January, because we are going to be re releasing a new Ask Vortex, specifically all about all those new products for 2018. So make sure you're asking us your questions in the comments below related to the new for 2018 products. And we'll release that while we're at shot from Vegas. So. Everybody, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.